All right, three more this week uh, until we start expanding next week. I think next week we have like what five or something. Yes, I believe so. Shit. Okay. Um, this week I think we're gonna start with Gods of Egypt, uh, which I was concerned about immediately because well, I'm a huge fan of uh, Alex Proyas as a director. He did uh, um, The Crow, Dark City, and Noen. Uh, all of which I love to different degrees. And the very first... I didn't even know he was doing another movie. The last I heard, he was going to do Paradise Lost with Bradley Cooper, and that got dropped. And he was going to do his Dracula movie, and that got dropped. Which sucks, because both of those, under his supervision, probably would have been awesome. So, I wasn't even aware that he'd finally gotten a project off the ground and made... The very first thing I heard about this movie was a headline that just said, Alex Proyas and producers apologize for whitewashing gods of Egypt. <laughs> that was my introduction to the fact that this movie existed. Oh boy. So, um, yes, that was causing a bit of a stir, apparently. Uh, so, I and I go to look at the cast list, and we've got um, that guy from Game of Thrones, and... Britton Thwaites and Gerard Butler and uh, Chadwick Boseman's in here uh, and Jeffrey Rush among others and it's one of those movies that begins I was I was concerned because this just really isn't my particular genre this is not really I mean with Poirot's name on it I was there was always a, a hint of interest regardless but this just really is not my genre I really anytime we get a movie like this it's just Oh, God. Uh, especially since it was, like, a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. Because for a while there, all the sites said an hour 40. And then just, like, two days ago, it, it was changed to its real time, which is two hours and seven minutes. <laughs> there, that's, that's, a big, that's a big difference for a movie like this. Yes. Uh, so I went in with a lot of concern. And that concern continued when the movie began. And the logos came up, and then we got that dreaded voice... You know these movies, these ancient times movies, or these, you know, mythological times movies that begin with us seeing, like, um, symbols and there is a narrator that's giving us a history lesson. And <laughs> um, Not yeah. a good start. It's just, and it's, it's typically a, a curse really that narrator <laughs> just just anytime you hear his voice it's just wow this is just this is just gonna be totally sleep inducing great and then we open and it's this big thing and at first i'm thinking because i don't really know much about it un until i'm watching it so i see these gigantic landscapes and that that familiar score and it's like it appears to be some biblical epic which is really not a genre I care for. I am intentionally missing a screening of the Ten Commandments at the end of next month. That's how much I don't care for biblical epics. Just, they just drain the life out of me because they're so, they're so long and uninteresting. <laughs> they have those narrators. Um, so the the one thing though that I keep thinking is. We're at a time lately where studios really don't seem to like taking risks. They really a lot of projects that I think could be really strong and really something interesting um, are typically stuff that studios don't take a chance on. So I'm looking at these vast landscapes and I'm thinking of all the projects Price has had that have gotten dropped, and it's this thing it star the biggest star in it is Gerard Butler and he's not even in the main credits he's in the whiff. Uh, um, he is a major character, but he's he's only the whiff in the credits. And you see these vast landscapes and these and all this stuff, and I just could not wrap my head around how do movies like this even get financed? It's really a mystery never <laughs> because known. they never do well ever, no. never, <laughs> especially nowadays. But nevertheless, this movie exists. And then, um, here's basically our main character, who is Brenton Thwaites. Now, I don't want to be mean to the guy or anything, 
but I think I've expressed a, a lot since I've been doing this that um, there's not a whole lot to this guy. There's <laughs> he's he's just he's just not he's just not enough um, because he was um, he was okay in the signal that little uh, sci-fi movie with uh, Lawrence Fishburne and I think he was Helen Hunt's son in Ride. That's pretty much the extent of the stuff he's done that's worth noting. Not his... One of the worst performances of the last five years on Oculus. And pretty much doing absolutely nothing in um, Maleficent, I think he was in. He was the yeah. prince that did nothing. Right. Just showing up and doing... Just, just, just being here to be here, to be a face. And it basically continues here. We start, and it's him and this girl, and they're in love, and they're exchanging high school play dialogue. Um, wow, the the writing is pretty shitty, and yes. the it's the it's these really stiff, awkward deliveries in these these voices that say like it's like it's like people in a high school play trying to feel like they're in some biblical epic of sorts. Um, I keep saying biblical epic. Obviously, this is not exactly what that is, but you get what I mean. It's kind of in that vein, or at least for the start. Um, but then we're introduced to, uh, the, like, our main god here, who is his, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, okay, yes. Um, Game of Thrones dude is a god, and his dad is Brian Brown. Uh, you know, FX, or Cocktail, something. Australians know who he is. Uh, <laughs> and we're also introduced to his brother, Brian Brown's brother, who is Gerard Butler. And Gerard Butler is Scar. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> he comes in, he kills his brother, and he takes over. Uh, and it's up to the nephew to take him down. <laughs> so... That's, it sounds a little familiar, just a little bit. Yeah, the good dinosaur ripped it off last year. <laughs> so, um, this random beggar who is Brent Thwaites and Game of Thrones dude are going to, after Gerard Butler blinds him, um, are going to team up and stop this all from happening. Uh, his reign of terror or whatever. Um, well, it's, and we kind of, it actually starts off absurdly quickly. Because we're kind of, we have our little introduction, and then Brian Brown's here, and he's doing his thing, and then Gerard Butler's there, and he's like, brother, and they have some expositional dialogue, and then just, he just kills him, and then a fight breaks out, and then it's just, it just all happens very quickly. Um, almost to a humorous degree. Um, and then there is, um, a fight that breaks out, and I was realizing that um, after a while, what they, what the gods can, like, morph into things, like metal gargoyles of sorts, when they fight each other, that's what they do. And so, this fight goes from, um, two people, two, two people who are human actors, obviously, they're playing gods, but obviously they are human actors, and they are fighting, um, and then it quickly turns into these two things fighting, and basically the entire movie... Um, for the rest of this scene is pretty much strictly animated. And I was starting to wonder, I wonder how this movie would have done if it was, like, entirely animated. And it was, like, hmm. like a like a motion capture type of thing. Um, if it would have maybe had a little more, um, I don't, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but it's, <laughs> maybe people would like it better if it was strictly animated and when they were just normal characters, that was like motion capture or something, kind of like uh, kind of like the Final Fantasy um, uh, animation, perhaps. Okay. Uh, and I mean, that's not to say though that um, and well, regardless, this fight scene is still pretty well shot. Um, I particularly like the way uh, the camera spins instead of doing the video game thing where one's right here and one's right here, and we just kind of keep cutting back and forth. And it's just this one kind of sideways shot. And, um, and, and yeah, when it's just them before they morph into whatever in God's name that was, um, it, the, the effects are kind of, you know, shoddy. 
it's it that's a very clearly animated Gerard Butler, you know, fighting, and it's it's like the animated Colin Farrell in Daredevil. Uh, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> um, however, I say that um, as we go on, um, the effects do get a lot better, and by the end, the effects are pretty fucking outstanding. <laughs> like, I don't know, like, what this movie's process was, but I felt like we were kind of gradually watching the progression of them putting them into place, because we start off, and they're kind of shitty and obvious, but by the end, these effects are incredible. <laughs> totally. I'm not sure what was going on at the beginning, but it was like they had learned, they kind of learned what they were doing as the movie went, but they just left the beginning <laughs> the way it was. Um, and then... And another, going on um, the thing about um, maybe it should have just been completely animated is there are some really cool scenes in this movie. Like, um, one in particular is when he picks up Brent Thwaites and then flies off. And this whole scene with him flying is awesome and, like, looks really good. It looks like something out of Pacific Rim or something. And then we zoom in and there's real life Britain Thwaites amidst all this animation around him as he's being carried off and it's like that's kind of I kind of yeah there would really be something to this scene without that in there <laughs> ruin the magic <laughs> if you just maybe take the live action out of it um I think it would serve it a lot better because obviously the thing is is why is the movie live action to begin with when like 30% of it is live action <laughs> and the rest of it is CG in one way or another um, but that portion of it is so good, it kind of, instead of saying, why don't we take out the animation and, you know, get some practical effects in here, it just makes you want to say, just make everything look like that. <laughs> just don't bother with the real stuff. If you're going to make it, you know, completely fake, if that's what fake looks like, then go all out and make it entirely fake. It'll look a lot better and, <laughs> believe it or not, be more convincing. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, and there's, you know, there's some other really good scenes in here, like, um, when he goes, when he has to go through the Goonies booby traps to get the eyes, um, I thought those were really, uh, cool designs. It reminded me of Indiana Jones. Okay, well, yeah, that too. Um, and, and there's the whole, and, okay, as far as it being a Proyas movie, um, I wasn't quite getting that feel. Mm -mm. Um, but there's always kind of, you know, some things that kind of do that. And there are, like, um, like, what was that? When she was in the afterlife and there was, like, that council or whatever. Yeah. They kind of, that was kind of giving me a sense of him. The, the him that we once knew in the 90s. Um, and, yeah, there's, so there's still, you know, there's still something in here. And the movie itself... Uh, on, not just the effects, but the movie itself um, gets a lot better as the movie goes. Like, I was really ready to give up on this uh, with some of that dialogue and the acting at the beginning, because that was just... You gotta power through that, but when, if you can do that, um, you might be okay. Uh, I know this movie's likely getting trashed, and it's of no surprise. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's pretty questionable in that beginning. One particular scene... Um, was just almost, if it wasn't so annoying, um, it would be hilarious. And that is, obviously a big portion of this plot is that Brendan is totally, totally in love with this girl, and she's totally, totally in love with him, and they, they bang at Rufus Sewell's house when he's not there. <laughs> Sounds pretty he's, out of context. And he... <laughs> And they're just in love, they're in love, they're in love, and that's all they talk about, and that's all they do, and they're just, oh, oh, you're my world, and you're my world, and stuff like that. And then they're um, going away in a chariot, away from Rufus Sewell's house. But the trouble is, is he's on the balcony with a bow and arrow, and he shoots it right through her heart and kills her. And after all this love, all this, this whole Romeo and Juliet thing they have going on, um, he watches her get shot through the heart with this arrow. And then they go on, and she dies. This fucking guy never reacts. <laughs> he, 
she gets shot in the heart with an arrow and she just kind of stands there and he kind of stares at her for a second and then he pulls the arrow out and throws it to the side and does not seem concerned that she's dead now <laughs> after all that and then the whole movie is about bringing her back from the afterlife it turns into what dreams may come <laughs> yeah um i i i do <sighs> I don't know. I was also kind of getting Pompeii vibes there yep. at the beginning. Um, so whatever. Uh, and I was confused at first about the gods. The gods are like huge. And it's... Because what I thought was going on for a while was there were they were normal sized people with a bunch of tiny people running around. But it's actually the tiny people <laughs> are the normal people. And the gods are huge. That's what we're looking at. Um, which, which looks a little ridiculous. Yes. Like, okay, to the movie's credit, though, um, even being this landmark special effects extravaganza that is, like, what people strive for when they do this, I've kind of felt like the, um, the Hobbit effects, um, like, when they're standing next to Gandalf and we have a full shot. Even in Lord of the Rings, it looks stupid. Yep. Um, and that's the, that's, like, the movie you strive to be when you're doing state-of-the-art special effects. And that they couldn't even make it look good, in my opinion. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, the scene in Return of the King when they're on the boat and Frodo's saying bye, I was like, "Wow, that just looks ridiculous." <laughs> um, so speaking of ridiculous, um, that was another way I kind of opened my mind to this. Was I went in thinking, "When it, this is before Rufus Sewell sh showed up, that was just a coincidence." Hmm. It, going in and I was thinking, like, if this is anything like Brett Ratner's Hercules, I think I'll be okay. Because that movie is so ridiculous, but it is so much fun. Oh, yeah. I really, I really like that movie. Um, I do. It's just, it's just, yeah, it's really, really dumb. But it kind of knows that it is. It's just that kind of movie, and it just does all that stuff. And there's actually a lot of intentionally funny things in it, believe it or not. Um, so I was thinking if this movie's anything like that, um, Ruby Soul obviously is also the Dark City connection. I didn't, it took me a second to register that, but I was like, yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, so, that, okay, we're getting in that territory now. Um, so, yeah, it's not as, like, it's not as self-aware as Hercules was. Um, I was a little worried it was gonna start being, like, the other, uh, Rennie Harlan's Hercules movie. Which was a fucking disaster. <laughs> um, but there is still um, a fun and entertaining quality to this one. It's not like... I mean, there's humor in there. Um, but it's not really... It's not legitimately laugh-out-loud funny like Ian McShane stuff and Brett Ratner's Hercules. But it's... You know... At least we know there's a sense of humor in there. Which shows that maybe there's a possibility this movie knows that it's a little ridiculous. Uh, which really, really helps. Um, and like I said, you throw the likes of Jeffrey Rush in there, that's that's going to add class to you regardless. Like I said, he even adds class to the Pirates movies, and that, that takes a lot. <laughs> um, so, uh, was there anything else I needed to mention here? Um... Gold. So yeah, there, yeah. There's gold everywhere. The the gods bleed gold. I thought that was kind of cool. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Most opulent movie of all time. Uh, the total opposite of Dark City. Yes. <laughs> um. So yes, I, as it started, I thought we were in a lot of trouble, but um. Yeah, it gets a lot better as it goes. It's still nothing great by any means. Like, it's still... When I say it gets a lot better, I mean it goes from complete shit to guilty pleasure. That's what I mean. <laughs> um, but that's, that's you know, for me, that's good enough, I suppose. Um, as long as it's really, really entertaining, I, 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 it completely by surprise, um, once the narration stopped, um, I was never bored with it, really, despite how long it is, which is strange and a surprising feat. <laughs> um, and like I said, there is still, um, there is still a sense of humor in there. Most of, uh, Chadwick Boseman's stuff is meant, uh, is played for laughs, which is good. I particularly like, um, when he just now realizes that Brenton Thwaites is there, and his response is, oh, I thought you were a straight baboon or something. <laughs> I just like how smug Gerard Butler is during the whole movie. 
Yeah, Gerard. Yeah, he actually makes a really good villain. Here. Yes, he does. And um, I'm kind of glad they didn't go for. This isn't really the kind of movie that would go for you know meta references or anything. Mm -hmm. But yes, there is a scene at the end during the final confrontation where somebody is fighting Gerard Butler on top of a height, and one of the lines they say to him is, "This is madness." <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're fucking asking for it oh yeah well, come on man seriously the people that are gonna flock out to this movie are gonna love that line um so i'm pretty sure that's just pure coincidence though so because the line is just kind of said in passing really there's no it's not like you know ceremonious or anything no um so like it like it was almost kind of like an afterthought where i was like holy shit they, they really opened themselves up for that <laughs> um but no. So, uh, yeah. You know, if this is your kind of thing, uh, you, you'll probably have fun with it. Uh, it's really not my thing, but it's, you know... As long as these movies find a way to have fun, then I'll be okay with them. Like I said, if you're... Because Ratner Circulates is one of the last movies I ever expected uh, to always be defending. Uh, just <laughs> So... Yeah, just, you know, if you just have fun, um, that's fine. But if you see it as a total piece of shit, I'm not going to argue with you either. It's, <laughs> um, I can see it from both perspectives. And yeah, I, it definitely falls into that guilty pleasure territory. So, um, yes, that's that's a relief, exactly. <laughs> to, say, to say the least. Um, okay, uh, our second movie is going to be Triple Nine. Um... I didn't know much about this either. I don't think it's had a whole lot of uh, one press behind it. One trailer that I remember. So um, apparently the Red Band trailer got a lot of attention, but I didn't hear about that until relatively recently. And when that was like when the trailer start came out and people started watching and commenting on it, um, one thing I kept hearing uh, that people were saying based on the trailer was they thought it looked like heat. Like a, like a really gritty heat. Um, so, uh, but going in, I wasn't really even sure what the plot was or pretty much anything, except that it had a really, really awesome cast list. Yes. An overwhelmingly awesome cast list. One of those cast lists that you just know somebody's going to get screwed. Somebody is going to be totally wasted at one point or another um, and not be able to show their full greatness amidst such a stellar ensemble with so many people doing so many things. But um, it's also worth noting the director is John Hilko, which is really bizarre. He is the director of The Proposition, The Road, and The Lawless. That's what this movie was missing, Guy Pearce. Right. I was like, I was waiting the whole movie for a cameo, and he never showed up. That's I was crazy. sad. Um, it would have been cool to see him in this, too. I agree. I, I would love to have known what he would have done. Um... So, anyway, I could see him in Woody Harrelson's part, actually. Yeah. Um, kind of like a, like a drunk, stoned version of his character in Animal Kingdom, basically. <laughs> so, um, what we have here is uh, a heist goes down, and that's basically for this um, big evil criminal who is Kate Winslet, of all people. <laughs> um, but the only trouble is... Is that they have to do one more job, and they're tying up loose ends, and bodies pile up. Uh, and there's corruption, and turns, and shit everywhere. Um, and it's obviously, um, a couple of the people involved in this heist, um, are cops. So, and, and sometimes, in Anthony Mackey's case... Uh, the cops that are also investigating said heist. <laughs> so, um, Anthony Mackie really kind of dextered the robbery world there. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it was very, it, for a while there, it was kind of, since I didn't really know what it was about, that kind of, I kind of struggled to get into it at first. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't really tell, because we've got, um, we've got Chua Telegia 4, Anthony Mackie, Aaron Paul, and... Clifton Collins Jr. and Norman Reedus. And it's one of those cases where you're trying to figure out who's who and exactly where they play into what's going on. Um, the only issue is that the very beginning of the movie is this big-ass heist, which is a really cool scene that leads to um, this really crazy-ass shit that happens uh, on the highway. 
Um, the only trouble is, is they're all wearing ski masks. So as you're trying to figure out which character is which and figure out how they fit into the story and stuff like that, um, for the first 10 or 15 minutes of the movie with this really big opening scene, uh, you can't really tell who is who or what they're doing. <laughs> um, but as the movie plays out, it gets much easier. Uh, I, if I were to see the opening scene again, I could probably point everybody out. Um, but just going into it fresh, uh, I was having trouble. But once it got going and I realized what kind of direction we were going in, um, it was very easy to uh, fall in line with it. Uh, we also have Casey... Uh, um, obviously, we have Woody Harrelson, who is um, the kind of big detective. And then his nephew, who is Casey Affleck, who is Anthony Mackie's new partner who is not aware of what's going on in all this, and there's a whole bunch of kind of little plots that kind of tie together into this whole... They all connect in one way or another um, as we go towards our bloodbath of a climax. <laughs> um, last night I had said that it's, it's very weird uh, that this is a Hillcoat movie because, um, much like I was talking about with Proyas, with Gods of Egypt, um... I've only I've only seen the proposition of the road and lawless once each. So he's not somebody that I've really, really kind of studied and really, you know, know his techniques per se. Um but just having seen each of his movies once, um, I got zero Hellcoat from watching this. I never if I didn't know, I never in a million years would have pegged him as the one behind this. Um, last night I told somebody it was like if David Ayer did Killing Them Softly. Um, this has David Ayer written all over wow. it. Wow. Like, I would have, I would have, like, once again, if I didn't know and you were telling me to guess, not only would Hill could have been my last guess, I would have 150% swore up and down this was a David Ayer movie. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but no, obviously he's busy with Suicide Squad, so it couldn't have been him. <laughs> right. Um... Uh, so, yeah, and on top of this, uh, also, it, it's very interesting uh, to see um, Woody Harrelson and Casey Affleck uh, not only being family members, but being friendly with each other after Out of the Furnace. <laughs> I got vibes of Out of the Furnace in this movie, too. Was it the presence of Woody Harrelson and Casey Affleck? <laughs> I, I think it was, but it was just the, gener the, the feel of the movie. Mm. The general feel made me feel just like that, Out of that the really, Furnace. really dark. Dark, gritty, violent. This movie's so vile. Oh my god, yeah it is. <laughs> this movie has severed heads, point blank headshots, torture, bags of teeth. Any fucking thing you can think of, really. <laughs> um, explosions. All that stuff. Um, there's a really, really intense scene in the middle of this movie that kind of acts as a centerpiece. Um, where it's, uh, when they, uh, they're raiding, the, they raid an apartment and they're just kind of going from room to room really quietly. And we know some dude is waiting somewhere. We just yeah. don't know in what room he's in or where he's at. And this eventually goes into this uh, shootout and then ultimately this chase. And it's, it's it's a really nice centerpiece. It's really, really good stuff. <laughs> um, and then we have... Uh, he didn't get a lot of screen time, but somebody that really left an impression on me was Clifton Collins Jr., um, his character is really, yeah. Uh, he's basically the guy that, um, he's also like the forensics guy, um, with the cops. And there's at one point where he's, he's the one that kind of doesn't mind tying up loose ends. And at one point he's talking to Anthony Mack and he's basically saying like, you know, you know, if we have to, you know, like kill some cops here to tie up some loose ends, you know, I know you guys are all iffy about it, but you know killing cops to me is like killing anybody else and it's like this guy's not fucking around <laughs> um this guy will do what needs to be done and that is scary <laughs> um so i really like every time his character's on screen um there's some kind of intensity and that all kind of leads up to the fact that the last half hour of this movie um uh, my heart was out of control like I thought I was, I thought I was gonna have a heart attack during the last half hour of this it's movie. It's super intense. Like the whole every movie. like every scene after the next for the last half hour is just you have no idea because this is one of those movies where every but every character in the movie, with the exception of maybe Casey Affleck, even though sometimes we're not quite sure about him either, um, everybody in this movie is a total piece of shit. Oh yeah, which means that they're all expendable. 
Like any of the the cast list is alphabetical. That means any fucking buddy can be off at any given time. And the movie makes us feel that the whole time. And that just really adds to the whole thing. Um uh, Winslet is a very interesting casting choice. I don't think she's bad. She's gonna get she's gonna get shit no matter what because she's doing an accent. So she's gonna get bad reviews regardless, just because she's doing an accent. But um, I do think it's a very interesting casting choice, and I didn't think she was that bad. Uh, she was very much like uh, Selma Hayek in Savages. That's the vibe I was getting from her. Um, only not quite as over the top. Um, I saw his name in the credits, and I gotta tell you, I was a little surprised when I saw Michael Kenneth Williams. Yeah. Not, not, the, kind of, not the kind of part I was expecting from him. <laughs> Um, I won't say, I'll just say, when you see Michael Kenneth Williams, you're gonna be surprised. <laughs> I had to look, I was like, is that, is that, I was like, yeah, it certainly is. I was like, okay. Yep, that, that was definitely him. Yeah, I know it was. Um, so yes, yeah, so there, and there's, um, there's one particular scene towards the end, um, that just kind of blew my mind, because it was like, um, it's one of those cases, it was the perfect setup, where it was like, um... They set you up for one thing, and you're just really, really on your edge waiting for something. And just when you're waiting for that one thing to happen, another thing happens. Um, and it's just... It just with scenes like that, um, with a movie with directions, you have no idea where it's gonna go. Um, there was one particular scene, though, where I was kind of like... Like, you could... It's like, as soon as it reached a point, you were like, Okay, I get where this is gonna go, and that is where it went. Um, but you kind of take pause after that because you're just like, wow, that character took a massive risk there. Uh, <laughs> I know I gotta be super, super vague because I don't want to say anything because I really want you to see this movie. Um, but yeah, um, so there's really not a whole lot else I can say. Um, there's very, there's not... Yeah, a couple, like, um, really, uh, it's pretty much the women in the cast list that get the shit into the stick. Like, w Winslet's screen time's only so much, um, there's the, the woman that's playing Wonder Woman, uh, is there for, like, a couple or a few scenes. She's there... basically, she's basically like the Kate Winslet saying, this is how I get Chiwetel to do my shit. Uh, Teresa Palmer is Casey Affleck's wife, she's there for, like, two scenes. Um... And shows off her ass. That's people. <laughs> the movie industry doesn't treat Teresa Palmer very well. I just realized that. <laughs> no, I mean it's weird. Gal Gadot is a weird thing because they're really trying to make her a big thing before Batman vs Superman comes out. Yeah, you can tell. Like, what's uh, what is she? What is she about to be in? She's got something else coming. It's, out. Is there like, something between this and that? But I can't remember what it is. I'm pretty sure there is. But um, yeah, there's not really much else I want to say. But um. Yeah, that whole cast, we, is, yeah, they're all, they all get to make their impression. Like, I, I didn't feel, like, yeah, some people get the shit into the stick, but I didn't feel like, like, I didn't walk away from this thinking, wow, that person totally had their potential wasted. Um, which is what a lot of casts like this do. All these actors are here to show something off. Um, and it's... Yeah, there's just I don't really want to say a lot. I like Winslet here too. I mean, she's she's important, but she doesn't really have to do much. Yeah, this but she's like, good at what she does. Yeah, this was like five minutes ago. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that though. Mm. She's in Criminal. All the uh, what is that, Costner? Yeah, and we got that. We actually got that trailer. Yeah, it's uh, co it's co it's basically like selfless, only it sounds better, and it's the director of the Iceman. Whoa. Yeah, everybody's in this movie, too. Ryan, Re Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds, Costner, Gary Oldman, Tommy Lee Jones, Michael Pitt. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. Yeah. Robert Dobby. Yeah, this movie's going to be great. I can't wait for it. Okay. April. All right. So, yes, just just see Triple Nine. Like, there's not a whole lot I can say without giving stuff away. Um, I, it's just awesome. Like, really. Do I mean, I can I can probably see people not liking it. Um... But don't be one of those people. <laughs> I can't see it don't lasting be. long, though, honestly, in most cineplexes. Yeah. But it seems so small. Like, I feel like I barely heard of it before it came out. Everything this week is small. Because I was like, and then I, because I, I looked it up on IMDb and I saw that cast list and I was like, how is this not being heavily advertised? Holy shit. Right. <laughs> um, 
So yes, um, yeah, just, just, just see Triple Nine, please. Um, give it some money. Uh, show, show Hollywood you want to see more movies like this. Um, let people, you know, don't let just David Ayer do this. Let other people give us this kind of stuff too. <laughs> don't, don't make David Ayer have to, don't put all the pressure on his back. Come on. <laughs> um, I'm really interested to see what Hillcoat's next movie is because this was just such, uh, this was just so off his path. Um, it's, it's his first movie set in modern day. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, nothing's really listed next, so I guess we'll see. Okay. Uh, our last movie is Eddie the Eagle, because it's already time for another inspirational sports movie. Yes. Yet another movie that you're just really surprised doesn't have Disney's name on it. <laughs> um, okay, before we go into anything, um, this movie began in a way I've never seen before. <laughs> so, um, the, um, all the commercials and shit happen. And then the trailers come up, and then the whole introduction thing that says, like, yeah, you know, we're finally starting now. Um, and then we fade in, and here's Hugh, uh, Hugh Jackman and Tara Edgerton sitting in front of an Eddie Eagle poster, thanking us for showing up. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. And just telling us that they think we're awesome for showing up to watch this movie. And then they leave us, and then the movie finally starts. I don't recall having seen that before. So <laughs> not that timing of a movie. Yeah. It's before, but not like that. Okay. Um, so we begin, and it's your. It's basically, you know, it's a very inspirational story. Obviously, it's true as well. Um, but nevertheless, starts off the way any of the others do. Uh, we have Eddie, who's this dorky little kid with leg braces. Who is absolutely hell-bent on being in the Olympics, despite everything around him. Like, his dad doesn't approve, he doesn't have practically any talent, he's not athletic, he's got fucking braces on his legs. There's really not a whole lot that he can do. Um, but for the love of God, he is going to be an Olympian, no matter what. Um, and eventually, we know something triumphant will happen when he discovers... Um, like ski jumping. So, um, I was I was interested. Um, the first thing I noticed immediately is that Matthew Vaughn's name is on this. Now, of course, with the presence of Hugh Jackman and Taron Egerton, that's not all that surprising. Um, we have an X Men connection and a Kingsman connection, <laughs> uh, and um, so I was curious who the director was. I did not know until it came up. I was wait I was watching the credits go by, and I was like, who's the director of this? I wonder. I'll just wait for it to come up and see. Um, Dexter Fletcher's the director of this. He's the guy from the Rachel Papers, and he was Cody in Kick-Ass, and he's in the Guy Ritchie movies. He did Sun Sunshine on Leaf, the uh, Proclaimers movie in 2013. I believe he is the... Did he do Wild Bill? I think Wild so. Bill, the British crime movie, not the Western with Jeff Bridges. Um... Yes. Okay. I know. Um, it blows my mind so, how on point you are sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Well, I've seen that movie. That helps. Right. Um, so, um, it's, what I, there's a lot of things to like about this movie. Like, you know, it's, yes, the uh, inspirational sports movie is a thing where, it's like, we talked about this, though, um, with that Costner movie last year, where, is and the inspirational sports movie is like the ultimate cliche, like it go, it goes way far back. <laughs> um, so the weird thing about it though is that it is this weird anomaly where every time um, there are still inspirational sports movies that use the exact same formula yet can still really really work really well. Um, where the person who there is no way they're going to succeed, and then they try their hardest and try to beat the odds, and it just looks absolutely impossible. And, of course, they're going to get bumps and bruises along the way and fuck themselves up along the way. But eventually they're going to get there um, and become a champion in one way or another. And it is insane to me. I mean, maybe it helps that so many of them are, like, real stories. But it's just... 
a formula that somehow, when it works, it really, really works, even today, in 2016. Um, it's such a weird genre that they <laughs> that it can still pull that off. Um, and one thing that really, really, obviously this movie would not work without, um, is Taron Egerton. Um, this dude's gonna be huge. Oh my god. I mean, yes. like, he's already getting there, obviously, but, um, I, this dude's gonna be a huge fucking deal. This <laughs> um, with the Kingsman sequel coming out and showing that he can do stuff like this, um, this 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 dude, um, that's another thing that really really helps the inspirational sports movie is having somebody to root for. And how in God's name can you not root for this guy? <laughs> is just every single thing is standing in his way, and he is nothing but smiles and thumbs up all the time. <laughs> And you'd think he'd be annoying, but no, you really, really want to see him do it. And then we bring in Hugh Jackman, who is, of course, the reluctant coach, who was the guy that used to be the champion until he became a drunk and a nobody and a laughingstock, but he still got it, and he can still coach his, and coach somebody to be what he could have been. It's the biggest fucking cliche in the book. But it works so well because of all the elements that work really well in this movie. And Fletcher's handling of it is really good, though. Like, this movie's really, really well directed. Um, it's it, Another thing that helps also is that, um, despite, like I said, it's a guy really, really trying to beat the odds, and a guy you just really, not only do you really want to see succeed... Um, but you can really sympathize for it. Oh, yeah, for sure. He's very likable. But the thing is, is that this movie is practically a comedy. Oh, yeah. Like, from beginning to end. Like, it's not one of those things where it's this inspirational drama that has comedy elements in it. This movie's pretty much a comedy the whole time. Um, yet yeah, still manages to hit exactly the kind of points that it needs to hit. Um, to make it all feel, to make it all ring true. Uh, it also helps that not not only is it the soundtrack, but it actually feels like an '80s movie. It really does, but not but not in like the dated way. No, not like you know, it nostalgic. Just, it feels like it's like this would have yeah, just like th the best movies, the best movies of this genre from the '80s, or what it kind of comes to. Um, and there's moments where yeah, sometimes like when he's taking tumbles or whatever. Um, it kind of seems like there's some CG in there that kind of takes away from it. But then you get these shots that are like these point of view shots oh, that really kind of put you in there. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, the direction can be really flashy. Obviously, it's, um, the chain kind of goes Dexter Fletcher, Matthew Vaughn, Guy Ritchie. Um, we're going to have flashiness <laughs> in here somewhere. So, um, we have stuff like, um... When Jackman does the uh, the ninety jump, uh, in uh, it goes into slow mo, and he like flicks his cigarette, and it like bounces off the camera. It's it's like that kind of stuff, where it's not really it doesn't seem like the kind of flashiness that would be in a movie like this, um, but somehow it just kind of all fits together. Um, and yes, uh, the training sequences uh, are really good too. There is a particular, this is the moment you missed, um, there's a hilarious uh, segment where he basically gets him to pull it off um, and to be able to get as high as he can and be able to land properly by comparing uh, the sport to sex with Bo Derek. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that was about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and they make one small reference to it uh, towards the end there, right before it starts, right before the last thing. Um, there's a there's a Norwegian coach in there that is basically uh, an SNL character played by Will Ferrell. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and believe it or not, I mean that in a good way. <laughs> it's um, back when Will Ferrell was like really in his prime in Saturday Night Live. It was kind of like, that guy seemed like he'd be one of those characters or something. Um, there's the really good scene towards the end there where it's like the guy that's basically his opponent. And they have like a real, th like he's just, the whole time this guy has just been like this unseen force that we only see on TV. Where it's like this guy's like one of the absolute best and you know he's just gonna crush you in this competition. And 
he seems like one of those guys that would be like the arrogant type because he's you know the ultimate at this and then they're in the elevator and it's just this really nice moment yeah. between them we learn that he's like he's always on he's on the same level and it's just very yes this whole thing the the there are so many things in this movie that if handled the wrong way would be so cheesy right but this movie just makes work um the shirts yeah the mom sweater yep and then the end and it's just like you know his dad's there and it's like in any other movie this would be so stupidly cheesy and here i am saying i must maintain my emotions <laughs> seriously <laughs> it toys with you it really does um in that moment when um and in just those times that were even though he's constantly upbeat about it there are those moments where he kind of reaches a bottom where it's like um when he's finally succeeded but it turns out that he's kind of um he sees it as things are great and he's playing up the crowd but he it's more of he's kind of like a punchline and just when he's really really happy he's on the phone with jackman and he's really happily telling him about it and Jackman just bluntly breaks it to him and says, like, this is just your 15 minutes, and this is going to be over soon, and you're just going to go back to being nobody. And we finally see him kind of break. But then right after that, we have the scene where he has the press conference, and he kind of tell, And it's just it's just so good. And Edgerton's so good in Oh, my this. God, I know. Um, God. <laughs> and there is... Um, there's a couple of people that show up. Uh, I had no idea Walken was going to be in this. Because there is... Um, he's on the cover of a book. And I was like, that's an... In like, is it just going to be some odd cameo? Is that not actually Walken? And I'm just thinking it is. No. But then later, there's a scene where he has, like, a voiceover. And it's like, well, yeah, that's definitely Walken. He, he does finally show up in person. Um, and we also have a commentator played by Jim Broadbent. That I was, was nice. I didn't know he was in this either. Did not either. Uh, they're both in the credits too, so it's it's clearly an actual part. Um, and yeah, there's just little. Um, there's also just little comedic things in there, like just little absurd things, like the um, um, in his parents' kitchen, the uh, Prince Charles and Princess Diana salt and pepper shakers, like <laughs> like just things like that. Um, yeah, there is a lot to like about this. Like I said, it is cliche land. Oh yeah, um, but it's just it just does everything so well. Like this is this is one genre that just feels like it can never die. Like there's just as long as you do it right, you can really really succeed with it. Uh, so yeah, this has been a yeah we've had. I mean, I don't want to jinx anything, but we've kind of had a strong start to this year. For the most Compa part. In comparison to the way we've started other years. For the most part. Um, let's see if we can keep this up a little bit. I think next week should be fine. But we'll talk about that in next week. Real quick, before we end another edition of AJ's Movie Reviews, we're going to uh, do a little star amounts for everyone. Gods of Egypt. Two and a half. Triple nine. Three. And Eddie the Eagle. Three. All right. Exactly what I thought you'd say. <laughs> So that's another edition of AJ's Movie Reviews. Next week is going to be Zootopia, as well as Lungs Has Fallen, and uh, the final one. We'll name the ones that you're going to be doing as well. Uh, the only other one, I think, is... Um, I'm hoping to see uh, Terrence Malick's new one, Night of Cups, with Christian Bale. And I think Natalie Portman's in there. Not that it matters. It's <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they're all in it for like five minutes, but... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, hopefully I can do that somehow. And Whiskey Tango Foxtrot will be on there as well. Just Tina Fey will yes. be gracing us again. It's Oscar weekend, so uh, check out our Independent Spirit Awards video. It'll be up tomorrow, and the Spirit Awards itself is tomorrow night, and the Oscars is Sunday, brand new verses. Your cryptic comment, <laughs> you know, we kind of change things up on you guys. Mm. So, uh, it's going to be a surprise. We wanted, we wanted to go for... I, it was an Oscar themed one, but mm -hmm. I right. another one kind of occurred to me that's much more Oscar-y. So, so that's going to uh, be your verses for Sunday, and more stuff coming on the podcast network: horror nights content, Universal content, as well as wrestling content, and sip and snack and 
the other regular segments here on Pop. Contro- controversy might be an interesting Controversy is a good one. I like that one. <laughs> controversy works just fine. So that being said, I want to thank you guys and girls out there for watching. AJ, any parting words? 